Hey, good morning guys. So now let's continue to discuss the third part of our chapter 4 topic. So let's discuss autopsy. Okay. <clears throat> Autopsy is a post-mortem examination. It's also called as a post-mortem examination. It is an examination of the body after death. So, for example, when death is sudden or occurs within 48 hours of admission in the hospital, usually autopsy is being conducted. But of course, um, the autopsy is being done upon the request of the significant others or the family of the deceased person. So after an autopsy, hospitals cannot retain samples like tissues and organs unless permitted by the consenting individuals. So usually in Western countries, in first world countries, autopsy of the body is actually important and is usually um, administered or given to the family. But here in the Philippines, it's super rare. So ang maka-afford lang anak ng mga Medyo na ay kwarta. Next would be certification of death. Uh, pronouncement must be performed by the primary care provider only. So in here in the Philippines, the only person who is allowed to pronounce death is the healthcare provider or the doctor. Don't uh, always remember that nurses and attendants, they are not allowed to pronounce death sa pasyente. The granting of the authority of nurses to pronounce death is regulated by the states. So, the as Filipinas, nurses don't have the, the responsibility or the capability to pronounce death. Only in the America, where in some states, um, allow nurses to proclaim or to pronounce that specific client as death, as dead person already. But there is a Pilipinas wala gina siya. So there is what we called do not resuscitate order. So for those students of mine who are actually employed now in the hospitals, they are familiar with do not resuscitate orders. A primary care provider can order DNR for clients who are in a stage of terminal illness or expected death. Like for example, in you're working in a hospital and then your patient um, is an elderly um, individual and then terminally ill or na siya cancer stage 4 so ano lang, comfort measures na lang ginahatag usually um, they want or the family wants to sign a DNR form signifying that they don't want their patient or client to be resuscitated so, dili nata pwede mag-resuscitate. Dili nata mag-apply. O, for example, nag-arrest ang pasyente. Kung nakasign na sila DNR form, you cannot actually resuscitate or do card cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Because, um, kasi, um, for example, nag-CPR mo and then nag-DNR status na yung patient. You, ca you are liable to that specific implementation. For example, pwede ka makasuhan na na a, uh, a low suit for you kung imuha ng gi gihimo so the nurse do not resuscitate orders generally written when the client or proxy express to do it for example um, the patient is, is unconscious or in, in comatose state um, she or he cannot actually give his or her decision so the significant others of such person that we call client proxy can actually um, signify that do not resuscitate orders. So always remember that. Do not um, perform CPR to those patients who are already in DNR status. Um, in, in the America, there is what we call euthanasia. So, what is euthanasia? Euthanasia is the act of painlessly putting to death people suffering from incurable or distressing disease. Meaning, um, there is a law in America wherein pwede na to 
for example, mag-administer, mag-administer tawag pang papatay sa isa ka pasyente when they um, voluntarily wants to be, you know, to to die painlessly. Like, for example, the patient is experiencing a metastatic, metastatic cancer, which is actually painful. So, they, they want to die painlessly. So, somehow, their significant others, their family, could approve the matter or a form of euthanasia. So, it's referred as mercy killing. So, that is euthanasia. So, there's what we call voluntary euthanasia, refers to a situation in which the dying individual desires over the time and manner of death. So, siya ang magbuot kung, for example, naka-ventilator support ang patient, siya ang magbuot if unsa nga specific time or unsa on siya pagpatay, maybe in intravenous medications or it could be diluted in IV fluids or what. So, naka-specify dito kung unsa iyang gusto. Inquest. So, inquest is is a legal inquiry into the cause or manner of a death. So, for example, when a death is when death is accident, an inquest is held to determine any blame. So, parang it's an inquiry about the patient death. So, there is um there are actually two licensed individuals who can. Um, perform the, the, the request of inquest. The first one would be coroner. It is a public official appointed or elected to inquire cause of death. The second one would be the medical examiner. is a physician and has an advanced education in pathology of forensic medicine. Organ donation. People 18 years or older and a son of mine may make a gift of all any part of their own bodies. So it can be made by a provision of will or by signing a card-like form. The card is usually carried out or carried at all times by a person. You can revoke the card. So how can you revoke? For example, you're carrying a card. So how can you revoke it? You realize that you don't want to share it to anybody when, for example, you're experiencing brain death. So some of your organs will be donated somehow. So, you can actually destroy the card or revoke the gift orally by two witnesses. So, they could sign it. It's like it's like a will that you don't want your organs to be donated when, when the times na emergency cases. So, there must be two witnesses for that matter. So, areas of potential liability in nursing. So, so what I've told you guys when you work in first world countries they are very much aware of their rights as a patient so it's easy for them or it, it's easy sa imuhang license to be revoked by the states of board of nursing so dali ra kaayo because somehow patients are aware kung sa gid ang tama kung sa gid mali so they could stand they they have the sort of autonomy or the right to decide for themselves so that's why daghan ug revoke nga license dito. The first thing that we were going to discuss is crimes and <clears throat> torts. So a crime is an act committed in violation of public punishable by lifetime imprisonment. So that is crime. A crime does not have to be intentional meaning does not have to be intentional to be considered as a crime. So, for example, you give wrong medication to your client, although mali ni mo siya, wa ni mo gituyo, but it is considered as crime. For example, namatay mong patient because you give wrong medication. So, although it's an accident, somehow, kasi wala man dyan ni mo gituyo, it's a crime. Okay? Next would be two classification. Two classification of crimes we do have. First is felony. And the second one would be misdemeanor. Felony, don't actually forget these terms, guys. Because you will be using this later concepts when we reach to <coughs> the next chapters. So felony, crime with a serious nature such as murder. 
Under felony is what we call manslaughter, second degree murder. murder. Okay, that's felony. Miss Dimenor naman, the second classification of crime, an offense of a less serious nature, which involved tort. Okay? Tort is a civil wrong committed against a person or person property. Tort naman, it can be classified in, as intentional tort. Or unintentional torts. Then let's discuss later. What are those difference? What are the differences rather between intentional and unintentional torts? There are two examples of unintentional torts. The first one would be negligence, and the second would be malpractice. So let's discuss first the negligence. <clears throat> negligence is a misconduct or a practice that is below the standard expected of an ordinary responsible and prudent person when we say negligent it doesn't imply to to medical professionals so for medical for doctors for nurses even non-medical as well pasabot um even plumber, even teachers, engineers, and a lot more professions can actually commit negligence. It doesn't mean nasa ano lang gina siya sa mga healthcare providers. And there is what we call as gross negligence. Gross negligence involves extreme lack of knowledge skills or decision that the, pers the person should clearly have known. For example, you graduated BS nursing, you took a board examination, and then you luckily passed. Then, of course, you will be employed in a hospital. You really have to, um, to make sure that you have the basic knowledge about nursing and doing, for example, intradermal, in intradermal injections, intramuscular, and giving intravenous drugs. So you just have to to know the basics. Now, when you work in a hospital, wala ka balong sa basic. Di ka ka balong mo intramuscular, di ka ka balong magatag in okay, mga medications. You are not aware of the right of medication, of giving drugs. And that is actually gross negligence kasi there is an indication of extreme lack of knowledge. Okay? And even also engineers, like for example teachers. Teachers um, should have all the principles and guidelines when they um, give teaching to their students. So if you, for example, as a teacher, as a teacher um, lack some of those principles or you don't actually exert effort to teach your students and then that might also lead to gross negligence. Next would be the second thing that we will we're going to discuss <clears throat> would be malpractice. Malpractice is a professional negligence occurred while the person was performing as a professional. <clears throat> Actually, there are six. <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. There are six. Elements must be present for a case of nursing professional negligence to be approved. So, pag mag court court na guys, mag under na siya gilusot, the six elements should be considered para makonsider siya as malpractice. And you have you really have to be familiar with the six elements because this will serve as your guide. If, for example, na commit bakag malpractice, and then you are going to check if this six elements are present if it, it if these elements are present of course you are charged of malpractice the first one would be duty okay that's the first element meaning nurse must have a relationship to a client so example na duty ka sa hospital you automatically have the relationship with a client so that's the first one the second would be Breach of duty, meaning something was done when it should never be done. Pasabot, bot bot ka. Dapat wala ni mugi mo pero gimo ni mo. Like you give medication without even relying to the doctor's order. Bot bot ka katao tambal. 
to the patient, wala na order sa doctor. This is actually part of the six elements of malpractice. So the third one would be foreseeability, meaning there must be a link between nurses act and the injury suffered. Pasabot ana, nagatagag tambal, bot bot ka, which is malik dito nga tambal, then nag suffer ang patient na mga side effect. So that is actually a link your between your act as a nurse and then the patient's injury. That's the third element. The fourth one be concession, meaning must prove that a harm occurred as a result of the nurse failure to follow the standard of care. So na na na, na prove na wala ni mugi follow, wala ni mugi follow ang kung sa dapat ni mong trabaho. <clears throat> The next one be harm or injury, meaning demonstrate the type of injury. It may be physical, financial, or emotional. And there should be pain and suffering. The last one would be damages. Nurse is liable for damages that may be compensated. Makaya lang. So that's are the six elements that you really have to memorize every now and then. Because that will automatically guide you when you work as a nurse in the future. Okay, next would be, I have, I have to remind you this one. Don't forget this term, res ipsa locitor. Excuse me, meaning the thing speaks for itself, okay? The thing speaks for itself. For example, when a surgical instruments or bandages are accidentally left in a client during surgery, that is that is what we call res ipsa locator. Meaning, kung mag-file or complain ng patient, pag-remove sa ilang surgical site, pag-open sa wound, nakita dito na nabilin gunting. And actually, this is true guys. Nabilin ang mga gos, OS dito sa chan. So, that's actually res ipsa locator. Dili na kailangan i-prove kasi nakita naman eh. That thing speaks for itself. Other example, some indication error are very serious that may lead to death like administering anticoagulant. Anticoagulant, guys, is nag-prevent na siya for your blood to coagulate. So, so kapag dili mag-coagulate imong blood, that may lead to bleeding. Okay? Because anti, meaning anti, it's against. So, for example, kuha ni mo ng antay, coagulant lang, sabot na is there must be a coagulation or ka nang para mag-stop ang bleeding. Yung si antay, naghatag ang medication which is anti, anti-coagulant that would lead to bleeding kasi wa may mag-coagulate na blood. And then, upon returning your patient from surgery, you give anti-coagulant na medication that may lead to hemorrhage. So, that's a res ipsa locator because your action the result speaks for itself they don't uh, they don't actually need to prove it because nakita na gyud kung sinaytabo because of your actions in some instances ignoring a client complaints can constitute professional negligence so how come so this would be the example a nurse does not report complaints of abdominal pain usually kasi when the client complain of abdominal pain there is a tendency that appendix will rupture for example um you're experiencing appendicitis now <clears throat> wala pa siya pain actually at first pero pag once mag ruptured na nemong appendix that may lead to painless na siya so that's why do not ever give medication to patients suspected with appendicitis. Kasi pag naghatag kag medication, dili ni mo maassess ang patient if nag-stop iyang pain or wala. Kasi pag mag-stop ng pain, that is a, a main indication that the appendix already ruptured that may lead to another problem and other complication, okay? So na may mga kaila, then feel ni mo appendicitis and pain sila, do not give pain reliever. Kasi once nagbigay ka ng pain reliever, 
hindi na niya ma-assess ang patient kung nagsakit na ba or wala. Kasi pag wala na nagsakit, that's an indication of ruptured of appendix. So, for example, you failed to assess the post of dressing of the client that he or she suffers from hemorrhage and die. So, that's actually professional negligence because you failed to reassess the patient condition. <clears throat> Okay, and the next one would be intentional torts. So let's discuss intentional torts. <clears throat> so the defendants executed the act on purpose or with intent. Pas about intentional, gituyo. Okay? There are four intentional torts, and I really want you to remember this as well because. Even mo take mo og international gihapon, mao gini gihapon ang ginabalik-balik sa sets of questions. Okay, you really need to understand the concepts. Okay. The first one would be assault. Okay. Ako gigan sa nyo, aw 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 pasabot. It is an attempt or threat to touch another person. Pero wala ni mo pasir gigunitan. Ingon na ni mo ang pasente. Ma'am, dili ka magpag-unitron. Kung anong taka ka ng tusokong taka. So, although wala ni mo siya gitouch, but you are using your mouth to give threat, to throw threatening words to your patient, that is assault. That's what they call Aw, aw, aw. It means you are just throwing words. Or other example would be, close fist, you are showing na parang isumba pa, dulong ni mo sumba ko yung patient. That's assault, okay? Next would be battery. Kung sa'ko nga na pa yung remember sa inyo, honey, that would be battered wife. Diba? Once battered wife, you're already touching the patient or you you would already um, use your force. Okay? That's willful touching of a person. When a nurse give medication without client permission. Okay, wala ka na nang need. Gidiritso ni mo siya intramuscular injection with Z-track pa with 90 degrees without even asking client's permission. That's actually battery because you are using your force against the client. Okay? So don't forget that. The third intentional tort would be false imprisonment. Unjust, unjustifiable detention of a person without a legal warrant to confine a person. That is why the client has the right to leave the hospital. That's what we call HAMA or Home Against Medical Advice or AMA, Against Medical Advice. Even here in the Philippines, your patient can actually leave the hospital. You just have to let them sign the HAMA form because if you didn't allow your patient to go home, kahit gusto niya na, that might lead to false imprisonment. Okay. The fourth one would be invasion of privacy, revealing information that might cause damage to the client reputation. Okay. You reveal ni mo ang iyang, for example, na ay sexually transmitted diseases, daghan tama kaya ng disease, disease. You reveal ni mo siya sa imo ang kauban ng nurse sa lain ng station ng dili involved sa iyang care. That may lead to invasion of privacy. Or either, mm, during invasive procedure, you're doing fully cut insertion. Um, wala ni magi cover, wala ni magi drape ang yung patient. That's invasion of privacy. So you really have to make sure that you upheld the right of privacy of the patient. But of course, there are certain information that needs to be reported, like vital statistic of death. And newborn, of course, kailangan magina, i-report magina. Infections and communicable diseases, abuse, violent incidents. So that's um, special scenarios that need to be reported immediately. Because remember, for the last discussion, nurses are considered as mandated reporters. Okay? Clients must be protected from four types of invasion. Use of client's name or likeness for pro pro profit. Unreasonable intrusion. picture picture ni mo ang client with using your own mobile phone. That's unreasonable intrusion. 
public disclosure or private facts. That's what I've told you na i-reveal mo siya sa taga-laboratory, taga-taga-x-ray. Diba? Gitabi niya mo siya, uy, kana siya good ba? Kinago niya siya kanang genital warts or na siya herpes and all. Gitabi niya mo siya. So that's in uh, disclosure of private facts. Another one was putting a person in false light. Meaning, um, uy, kuan ko na siya doon. Incompetent ko kaya na siya ko. Di ko na siya ka. Di ko na maayong nga tao. So that's you, you, you actually give the patient a bad reputation. The last discussion for, or the last slide we have is defamation. <clears throat> defamation is a communication that is false or made with careless disregard for the truth that result to injury to the reputation of a person. There are two types of defamation, libel and slander. Okay? When you're asked, what are the two types of defamation that would be libel and slander? Libel is a type of defama defamation through pictures, print, and writing. That's libel. Gisulatan ni mo dito, o gisulat ka dito na ang doktor, dili ka balo mo hatag o treatment, medication, di ka balo mo order. And then through that writing, gihatag ni mo sa lain tao, gipasapasan, that's libel. Slander naman is a type of defamation by spoken words. Okay? Gitabi-tabi ni mo siya. That's slander. Pika na gun a nurse. Kadi gun na maayo gun man rabaho. Or even, nagakuan gun na siya. Nagadrugs gun na siya. Ana. So that's slander. Ginasira ni mong reputation. Even though it's not actually true. Okay? So that's it. So that's that would be all for this. And we have a final discussion for this chapter. And I'll be, I hope that I will be able to forward or to send you the final lectures for this chapter. And that would be all, guys. And I hope that you've learned something for this PowerPoint presentation. And have a good day.